In this lecture, I'll discuss Chapter 1 of Lavenda and Schultz's Anthropology, What Does It Mean to Be Human? And this will provide a broad uh, overview of the class as a whole, the different subdisciplines of anthropology. At the end of this chapter, there's a module on you know, anthropology as a science, and we'll talk a little bit about that here as well as over the course of the semester. In its broadest sense, anthropology aims to describe what it means to be a human being. From an anthropological perspective, we look at issues uh, from a variety of contexts. We look at this in a very holistic framework. We look th at this in a comparative framework over, over broad periods of time, an evolutionary framework, and anthropology is also field-based. Anthropologists, uh, or anthropology, can be defined as the study of human nature, human society, and the human past. Now, to go through a couple of these definitions, anthropology is holistic. Um, this is how anthropology tries to integrate all that is known about human beings and their activities at the highest and most inclusive level. And so it's necessarily interdisciplinary, and anthropology uh, within itself looks at the different subfields and tries to make, take an integrative approach overall uh, in anthropological analysis. It's comparative in the sense that it, this requires anthropologists to consider similarities and differences in a wide range of societies before attempting to make any generalizations about human nature uh, human society or the past. It's also evolutionary in the context of requiring anthropologists to place observations uh, about human nature and human society in the past into a temporal framework that takes into consideration change over time. Anthropology relies on the concepts of culture to explain the diversity of human ways of life. A culture can be defined, as the authors of your textbook define it, as sets of learned behavior and ideas that we acquire as members of society. And human beings utilize culture in order to adapt to and transform the world in which we live. And you can think about the various modifications to the environment which humans make uh, in order to make the environment or particular species of animals suited to our purposes for what we need overall. And we'll be talking about this over the course of the semester in some depth. In the United States today, there are four, arguably five, subfields of anthropology. And we'll be talking about each one of these over the course of the semester. Biological anthropology, archaeology, cultural anthropology, linguistic or linguistic anthropology, and applied anthropology. Now, I mentioned before that anthropology is holistic. It's the integrated study of human nature, human society, and human history. And so what this means for anthropologists is that we look at not only the work in our own subfields, but other subfields to inform our analysis overall. Uh, and these particularly come together around applied projects wherein anthropologists utilize knowledge from the different subfields towards particular um, problems as they're defined in various cultural contexts. Biological anthropology looks at human beings as biological organisms and tries to discover what characteristics make them different from and similar to other organisms uh, in terms of the characteristics that they share. In biological anthropology, there are some major focuses, fo foci or emphase, emphases. Um, these are primatology, um, Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall is uh, probably key individuals here. Uh, primatologists study non-human primates, which are the closest living relatives of human beings. Uh, you also have paleoanthropology that we'll talk about quite a bit here in this class, the search for fossilized remains of humanity's earliest ancestors, human adaptability towards different environments, different ecological settings, uh, looking at human growth as well as human development. And then in terms of forensic anthropology, this is where many lay people come to know anthropologists through um, popularized television show shows like CSI or Bones or something like that. Uh, molecular anthropologists study the similarity, chemical similarities and differences in immune system, for example. Now, um, any scientific endeavor is a product of its time. Uh, we might say that science is... Uh, it can be argued that science stands outside of uh, these sorts of things, outside of any sort of cultural influence at all. Um, however, uh, in considering early work of biological anthropologists and others uh, along the lines of eugenic science, we can see very clearly that the work that these scientists were doing, if we can in, in reflection, call them scientists today, or at least how we would conceptualize science, uh, they were going into the field, they were doing research with a notion of the uh, inherent superiority of a given so-called race. And uh, 
so biological anthropology uh, was very much a, a race-based science early on. And it, of course, tied in with a project of justifying racism. Uh, racism is the systematic oppression of one or more socially defined races by another socially defined race, and again you'll see that in quotes there, that is justified in terms of the supposed inherent biological superiority of the rulers and the supposed inherent biological inferiority of those that they rule. So these are inherent characteristics. These are things that individuals have from birth, and so it justifies unequal relationship in terms of access to power, resources, and the ability to um, control um, other individuals. Uh, this was accomplished in the scientific context, at least, through measurement of cranial capacity, which uh, there were attempts to correlate um, things like cranial capacity to intelligence and al align this with the idea or the notion of race. And these skulls have been looked at numerous times in the American Anthropological Association's website, Understanding Race, uh, that will be reviewed for the class is uh, in fact uh, looking at and discussing this in some parts as well and, and how these studies uh, are flawed in terms of the um, in for first attempting to differentiate along the lines of race and second uh, along the lines of uh, no noting that there are no significant differences um, statistically significant differences between the cranial capacity in many of these studies and also the fact that you had the European uh, or English um, uh, individuals who were looking at cranial capacity and noting that English men had the largest cranial capacity and you had uh, people in the United States, American uh, scientists, and they were saying, well, American males, they had the largest cranial capacity. And uh, within anthropology, of course, this was contested. Uh, Boaz was a key individual here. He's founded uh, the first U.S. anthropology department and um, looked at human biology as well as culture in attempts to debunk racist stereotypes. In linguistic anthropology, the approach is uh, to look at cultural diversity by relating varied forms of language to their cultural context. And so you can see things like um, Louise Maffey's work on the overlapping or connecting ideas of linguistic, biological, and cultural diversity. And we'll talk a little bit about linguistic uh, diversity and language um, preservation, conservation movements, and how this ties into revitalization. Certainly this plays uh, a, a big role in the minds of some individuals in the Tana Otham Nation in looking not only at revitalization of um, traditional foods, but also traditional practices, and then the Otham language itself. Now, if we think about language in a broad context, this is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols used to encode one experience uh, of the world and of others. They're relatively arbitrary. There's nothing about this curtain here uh, or this table table or anything like this computer that uh, it inherently reflects computer or table or, or um, blinds or, or whatever. Uh, now, linguistic anthropologies, anthropologists have a number of different subfields. You have historical linguistics, which looks at how languages change over time. Comparative linguistics, which studies the relationship among languages in the same language family, uh, which descended from a common um, ancestor, proto-language. Um, language preservation and revitalization movements that I've talked about before. We'll talk about this in the context of Hawaii. Um, with Wendy Marshall's work, we'll also look at Hawaiian Pigeon over the course of the semester. Uh, further, we'll look at new forms of communication, computer-mediated communications, and how this uh, influences uh, potential communications between individuals, how things like gender might be able to be read, um, you know, things like um, various acronyms, abbreviations, shorthand, and, and how uh, that language carries over or doesn't carry over into uh, succeeding generations. Uh, we'll look specifically at Mike Wesch's work in Anthropological Introduction to YouTube. Now, cultural anthropology in the past was mostly concerned with the so-called, quote-unquote, primitive peoples. These were people that were peoples that were outside of the civilized wor world, outside of Europe, outside of the United States. And so the idea was that if we were doing anthropology, we were doing this out there. You were doing this somewhere else. Uh, whereas if you were doing sociology, this would be where you would be studying your own society. And so early on, it really uh, created this dichotomy between the West and the rest, the world, the idea of civilized society and primitive society. But of course, this had a lot to do with individual conceptions of um, you know, standing outside of time and outside of culture. Uh, and uh, you know, essentially saying that you know, this is where you could study these particular phenomena overall. Uh, 
increasingly today we see involvement of cultural anthropologists in a number of different uh, research settings which include um, things like um, looking at Pittsburgh, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins and their stadium and doing uh, applied work and interviews with people in terms of restructuring a stadium, working for Microsoft in terms of looking at internet cafes and piracy, um, doing um, all sorts of work, um, Haitian voodoo uh, in the context of New York City, uh, work on various native reservations, work in um, in the context of corporations as a whole, uh, Wall Street banks, uh, military, and we'll talk about some of these different case studies uh, as we go out through, uh, go throughout the semester. And what cultural anthropology attempts to do is show how variation in beliefs and behaviors of members of different um, human groups is in fact shaped by culture. And culture again is uh, the sets of learned behaviors and ideas that we acquire as members of a particular society. Anthropologists engage in field work. Uh, for a long time in anthropology, there was a con strong connection with museums, and still today, many departments are connected with museums. But increasingly, the trend in anthropology is towards um, doing extensive field work, particularly for um, PhD or dissertation level work. Uh, field work can be defined as an extended period of close involvement with people in whose language or way of life anthropologists are interested. Uh, during which anthropologists ordinarily collect, or ordinarily collect most of their data. Now, uh, they work with a number of different individuals which have been referred to in uh, a number of different ways, such as informants. Uh, increasingly, anthropologists have moved away from this because of the idea of connections with uh, either political informants or um, in the context of police. And so anthropologists use a number of different terms today when referring to the people that they're working with. Uh, respondents, teachers, friends, these sorts of things. Um, and there's generally a, a few key informants or um, individuals that anthropologists are very close to uh, in the field work setting overall. And we'll talk more about this in terms of the methods and approaches in cultural anthropology later in the semester. Archaeology can be defined as a study, uh, is a cultural anthropology of the human past with interest ranging from the earliest stone tools to 20th century garbage dumps or garbology. Um, uh, these archaeologists, archaeologists as a whole will examine artifacts, which are portable objects modified by humans. Uh, there's pretty extensive documentation. I myself worked on a field site in Wolf Creek, Pennsylvania, where we uh, unfortunately had the uh, privilege of digging up a lot of historic glass that a bunch of good old boys came out and essentially were you know, having a bonfire, drinking some beers, smashing the glass right over the site, and we ended up documenting a lot of that you know, quote-unquote historic glass. Uh, Archaeology in a broad context can be um, divided in a couple different ways. Um, you can have individuals who are interested in historical societies that were, and you have a written record, and those that are um, uh, interested in prehistoric societies. Uh, archaeologists as a whole may be interested in stone tool manufacture, metallurgy, or ancient pottery. Um, so lithics, and there's a number of individuals here um, that do um, this sort of work. And, uh, We'll be talking more about archaeology over the course of the semester. Now, applied anthropology utilizes information from other anthropological specialties in order uh, to solve or attempt to solve uh, practical cross-cultural problems in areas such as healthcare or economic development. Uh, and so you have medical anthropology in the bottom there. You can see some anthropometry, this idea of measuring uh, the growth of individuals, which would be important to look at any sort of stunting that's occurring, look at where uh, nutritional interventions might be made in a community, um, looking at how um, disease progresses, the etiology of disease, uh, conceptions of disease and how this interacts with um, the medical profession, the biomedical profession in the United States in particular, looking at um, native populations, indigenous populations, migrant populations, uh, and looking at how beliefs um, will align with uh, what medical doctors are saying or perhaps uh, diverge from what medical doctors are saying. And so anthropologists have been involved uh, fairly extensively in medical studies with National Institutes of Health and other organizations as a whole. Anthropology 
in a broad perspective and some of the things that I'm hoping that you'll get out of the class. We talked a little bit uh, on the first few days about you know the idea of, of science and thinking about that in a broad context. But in a, in a real basic sense here, if I, were to, if I was to distill the class and some key ideas that I'd like uh, you to at least consider over the course of the semester is how do we make sense of our lives in relation to others? Why are certain things important to you? Uh, and important to other people, um, the values that are are put on particular um, things. That, so, for example, the idea of attainment, the idea of attainment of material goods, and we'll talk about this in the context of economic anthropology. Um, and we'll talk about Marshall Solins's conception of the original affluent society and how one actually achieves affluence, how how success or the idea of prosperity is measured for individuals. Also, since anthropology is a holistic perspective, we'll be bringing in uh, multiple disciplines in, in our discussions throughout the semester. And so the, one of the key things with anthropology and one of the strengths of it, in my opinion, is that we can, in fact, uh, look for holistic solutions to things like global problems that we're experiencing today. And part of this, I think, is the idea of extending empathy and understanding to uh, fellow human beings overall. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the anthropology is a science. The authors of the text, Levend and Schultz, come out and say that anthropology is a science and that scientists uh, tell a story about the way the world works, but they're not the only ones that tell a story about the way the world works. They're different, however, these scientific stories are different from other stories because they remain open to testing uh, that will either confirm or refute them. And uh, hence, stories um, that uh, are open to testing or this idea of testability is a key feature of science um, as a whole. If it's not testable, um, then you're not doing science. Again, uh, one of the things that we'll talk about over the course of the semester too is this notion of theory. And I want to point out that scientists use the term theory in a different way that, than lay people might use it. Um, lay people might say something like, well that's just a theory and that might be a really uh, dismissive way to look at something. Whereas in a scientific context, if you have well-confirmed scientific theories, these are taken very seriously because they're continually tested and retested and retested, and um, they uh, are not disproven. Um, so they're con and they're continuously open to testing uh, over time. And the theory of evolution uh, is one of these, and we'll talk more about that over the course of the semester and some of the debate and discussion around that in the United States, which of course is very cultural. Uh, Myths, on the other hand, uh, here you can see a juxtaposition of myths versus science. Myths are stories whose truth seems self-evident because they do such a good job of integrating personal experiences with a set of wider assumptions about the way society or the, or the world in general must operate. And they tell, I mean, these, these are potentially very powerful myths. These can be founding myths of particular societies, stories about where we're going, uh, where we've been, and where we are today. So they can be very powerful in framing understandings of the world around us. Um, again, um, in anthropology, if you're doing um, scientific work, it's based on evidence. Um, in the context of archaeology and paleoanthropology, you have both uh, material evidence, the things that you can see, the, thing, the objects that you can pick up, the artifacts, the uh, human remains uh, or hominin remains, and then the inferences that you make based on those remains. And we'll talk more about that in the context of archaeology and paleoanthropology with dating methods and context in particular sites. Again, if it's open to um, testing, you have a hypothesis uh, which asserts some sort of particular um, connection um, and then testability uh, is being able to um, test a particular um, topic or idea. And again, the idea in science is this notion of objectivity or separation of observation and reporting from the researcher's wishes and then reporting the results even when they undermine their own hypotheses. And we can see, you know, in applying this notion of objectivity to early work of anthropologists, particularly along the lines of um, race and racism and tied in with the idea of unilineal evolution, the idea that anthropology in the past was only something that could be done in so-called primitive societies, we can see that early on it certainly wasn't something that was very objective. <laughs>